My Bible is open to Ezekiel chapter 22, and I would encourage you to open your Bibles there as well. And as you're turning to there, let me go ahead and welcome everyone tonight, especially those who are visiting. We are certainly glad to see those who are visiting with us tonight. There's so many things you could be doing on a Monday night, middle or the end of October, getting ready for our winter that is about to come. There's so many friendships of people that I've known throughout the years that are with us tonight, and I just cherish those relationships of those who are visiting with us that I've known throughout the years. There's so many that are here tonight that it's, it'd be hard for me to mention all of you, so I'm going to leave that alone. I'm thankful for your presence tonight, as well as the membership of the congregation here. It has been a just a joy for me to be with you to this point, and I'm excited about the remainder of the lessons that we're going to be studying both tomorrow night and Wednesday night as we close out the meeting. You may notice on the screen behind me a very interesting question. Where have all the men gone? You'd be surprised at how many of the ladies have came to me privately and said, I look forward to that lesson. <laughs> so now is your opportunity. Ezekiel chapter 22 is where we're going to take our text from our lesson tonight. But as we get into our lesson, I want to assure you that as society is trying in every way to feminize our culture and try to feminize the masculinity of man, I put together a few reminders as to why it is that it's still good to be a man. It's still good to be a man. Let me give you an example. Phone conversations are over in 30 seconds. That's a good thing to be a man. A five-day vacation, five vacation requires only one suitcase. And so we like that sort of thing about being a man. You can open your own jars. You can go to the bathroom without a support group. Those are <laughs> things that we enjoy about being a man. But as we study tonight about the concept of where have all the men gone, we're going to look at it from a very serious note. And so my advice to the wives is, is that I know this, this lesson has probably been circled on your calendars, but my advice to you tonight is you can help us. You can help us tonight. I'm going to start out with keeping our elbows to ourselves. If you're not one that's a normally a note taker, don't be taking notes tonight for this lesson. And I can understand and assure you that as we study these things from God's Word, that I can tell you that I am no expert on this. And as I preach this lesson to you, I want to assure you that I don't have it all figured out, but I can turn to the Word of God and understand what it is that He wants us to do as men in the realm of spiritual leadership. And so as we consider those thoughts tonight, I want to bring your attention to... A, <clears throat> a Time Magazine cover that, that took place back in 1992. And the question on this Time Magazine is, is where are, uh, uh, why are men and women different? And I don't know if you can see this subheading, so I'm going to blow it up for you right here. It says, it isn't just upbringing. New studies shows that they are born that way. And so as Time Magazine was trying to figure out the difference between men and women all the way back in 1992, I want to fast forward us up to our present day. This was an article that took place in 2015, just about six years ago. You see, in 27 ways to be a modern man. This was an article that uh, was posted in the New York Times back in September of, of 2015. 27 ways to be a, a modern man. Now, this caught my attention. Because I wanted to understand what exactly a modern man was or what the New York Times had envisioned to be the modern man. And I pulled out three things out of the 27 that just caught my eye that I wanted to share with you. And this is, this, believe me, if you have time, uh, you might want to Google this article and take a look, for, look at it for yourselves. But here's three of them that, that stuck out to me. It says, the modern man cries, and he cries often. The modern man has no use for a gun. He doesn't own one, and he never will. On occasion, the modern man is the little spoon. Some nights when he is feeling down and vulnerable, 
he needs an emotional and physical shield. I don't know about the spoons, so I had to look that up. But this gives you an idea of really the feminization of the modern man. This gives you an idea of what our culture envisions insofar as masculinity and the masculinity crisis that is taking place among the modern man. David French of the National Review laments a new statistics that shows today's young men are physically the weakest generation in recorded history. Here's what he said in his article. He said, if you're the average millennial male, he writes, your dad is stronger than you are. In fact, you may, be, may not be stronger than the average millennial female. The very idea of manual labor is alien to you. And even if you were asked to help, say, build a back porch or a deck, the task would exhaust you to the point of uselessness. Welcome to the new post-masculine reality. That's the way David French described it in the National Review in his article. So the question that is before us tonight as we consider this idea of what it means to be a man, what it means to, to understand what God has intended for us as men, is where have all the men gone? And I'm not really interested in it from this perspective right here, from the cultural perspective. I'm interested in it from a biblical perspective. I'm in, interested in this from a spiritual perspective. In our text in Ezekiel chapter 22, there was a very interesting situation that happens in the book of Ezekiel as God looked down upon mankind and I want you to notice what is taking place. He looks down and he recognizes that there was just complete disarray in society. And so as he looked at Israel and he recognized that, the, that, that people were doing whatever they wanted to do, he had the urge of wrath to come down and, and, and implement judgment upon these people. And so we're going to pick up our reading here in verse 29. It says, the people of the land have used oppression and committed robbery and mistreated the poor and needy, and they have wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall or stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. I want you to think about how sad that picture is as we read Ezekiel chapter 22. What God is telling us here in this passage is, is that he looked down upon Israel and he sought for a man to stand in the gap. Now, this idea of standing in the gap comes from the idea of when cities used to be build walls around their cities. And, and if there was a gap that, or, or, or a hole in the wall, then oftentimes the enemy would exploit that hole. And once they exploited that hole, they were able to enter the city, and that was a, a very weak spot. And so what God is saying is, is that there is a man that needs to stand in the gap so that he would not implement his wrath and his judgment. God said, I look for a man to stand in the gap, and there was no one who was willing to be that man. He was looking for someone who was righteous to go to bat for the people and say, do not bring forth your judgment on the people. There is still hope. There is still a chance for us to repent. Let me give you an Old Testament example of where there was a man who stood in the gap. Over in Psalm chapter 106, the psalmist writer tells us that this happened once before. He said, therefore, in Psalm 106 and verse 23, Therefore, he said he would not destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. You recall the time when Moses had gone up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And God looked down and he saw that Aaron had built a golden calf. And he told Moses, get off of this mountain. Go down to your people. I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to take the promise away from Abraham. And I'm going to give it to you. And we're going to start all over again. And Moses said, far be it 
Lord, that you do that. You can't do that. You've promised these people. What would the nations around us say about this? And this was a time that a godly man stood in the gap and stood what was for, what was, what was for right and reasonable and righteousness among them. And he was able to turn away the wrath of God. But Ezekiel said, God looked out for this man and there was no one. So my question tonight as we consider this idea, is where have all the men gone? Are you the type of man who would step up into the gap? Could you stand in the breach? Are you trying to live a life of righteousness? Well, let's find out. Let me ask you this. Where are you men when it comes to work? Now, you may think, well, what's that got to do with my spiritual life? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look at the scriptures. God expects us as men to have a work ethic. And from the beginning, if we go all the way back to the beginning, even before the fall of mankind, I want you to consider this in Genesis chapter 2 in verse 15. You see, a lot of people have the misconception that if it wasn't for Adam and Eve and all that sin in the garden, we'd be sitting somewhere in some garden eating fruit by the basket load and all of that, and that we wouldn't have to work the way we do to earn a living, and that Adam ruined it all. For, not, not true. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, after God had put Adam in the garden, you notice what it says there in verse 15. He said, I'll put man in the garden to tend and to keep it. See, God had intended for us to work all along. God expects for you to provide for your family. Now, why do I bring this up? Because I'm starting to see a trend in our culture today where men don't want to work, where men don't want to provide for their family, where men are expecting their wife to carry the load. I'm starting to see that trend, and i got to tell you, there's nothing that could be any more contrary a biblical principle than that idea right there. Let me give you a couple of verses to support that. Proverbs 13 and verse 4, a very general passage tells us that a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. There's the idea, the concept, the principle of working. You remember what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 about working. If a man is unwilling to work, neither shall he eat. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. I got to tell you something. There's something in that passage that we often overlook, isn't it, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. And that is this, not only are we to work and to provide for ourselves, but we're to work in such a way that we can help others. Notice what he says there, that they may have something to share with those in need. How many of us men go to work every day, not only with the intent to provide for our family, but with the intent to help? the intent to share with someone who is in need. I want to make another observation for you as we're on this subject. You see, our work habits, men, our work habits reflect our life as a Christian. You know that? Our everyday work habits, and I'm talking about when you get up at 6, 5, whatever time you get up and you go to work, the way that you do that kind of reflects your life as a Christian. And so if you're a lazy worker and you're dragging your team down at work and you're showing up late and that's the type of worker you are, then there's a pretty good chance that's the type of Christian you are as well. Let me show you why I say that. Because the Apostle Paul writes to us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. 
Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the, the Lord Christ you are serving. You see the point that Paul's making there? When we work, when we work to provide for our families, we work to help those who are in need. The way that we work, our attitude toward that is reflective by how we are as a Christian. Colossians chapter 3. Where have all the men gone? Let me suggest to you tonight, secondly, where are you when it comes to purity? I'm sure every one of you have, are aware of the crisis in our society as it pertains to purity. The Apostle Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18 to flee sexual immorality. But you know, it doesn't take me very long to read the statistics in our society today and realize that it sickens me to see what's going on. So I wanted to share a couple of them with you. I read in the statistics that one in five total web searches worldwide are for pornographic material. Now, brethren, this used to be something that was shameful. This used to be something that was not talked about because it was so shameful. It was hidden in the corners of society, and now it's joked about on every late night show as though this should be part of everyone's sexual experience. 36% of all men over the age of 30 that was surveyed admit to cheating on their spouse. $16.9 billion industry is, is what is established insofar as the pornography industry. Now, I want us to put that into perspective. $16 billion is what the porn industry currently generates. If porn was a country, it would outrank 72 gross domestic products in the world. Outrank 72 other countries in the world if it was just its own entity. I want us to recall the story of Joseph back in Genesis chapter 39. We remember the story of Joseph and, and Potiphar and, and Potiphar's wife in Genesis chapter 39. It's a very familiar story to us. And I want us to think about what took place here in Genesis chapter 39. And we're going to pick up our reading here in verse 7. In Genesis 39 and verse 7, we recall that Joseph was working in Potiphar's house. And, and that he, was, he had become so visible in Potiphar's house that Potiphar put everything under his control. There was nothing out in Potiphar's house that he did not trust Joseph with. And the Bible says that in, in Genesis chapter 39, and we're going to pick up in verse 6, that he left everything in Joseph's hands there except the bread in which he ate. And now Joseph was handsome in his form and in his appearance. Now what I want you to zero in on here is verse 7. And it came to pass in these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. I want to stop right there. Now, I'm not going to be graphic where the Bible is delicate here. So I want you to use your imagination. You understand what's going on right here. Now, I want us to see Joseph's reaction to this approach by Potiphar's wife in verse 8 and 9. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in this house, and he has committed all that he has had to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything back except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, men, I want to make... A point about these two verses right here. You see, God has revealed to us two motivations in this story. There are two motivations for sexual purity, and I want to point them out to you in this passage right here. The first one is this. I will not betray those who have been good to me. 
I will not betray my wife. I will not shame my children. I will not disgrace my parents. I will not dishonor the church. I will not be this selfish, is what Joseph said. I will not dishonor those who have been good to me. And the second thing that we get from verses 8 and 9 is this. The second reason here is, how can I sin against God? You see, sexual sin is against God. I want you to look at what He's blessed you with in your life. Are you willing to risk it all on the moment of pleasure? It was a man, that man and his wife that came to my wife for counseling not too long ago. He and I sat down and we talked. He was involved in an affair a couple of years ago and they're still struggling and working through this and they're trying to save their marriage. And so I sat down with him and I said, you and I are going to make a list tonight of why it is that you want to be pure, why it is that you want to make these changes in your life, why it is that you are no longer having affairs, you're no longer involved in pornography and all of this other stuff that have caused your life to go a disarray. So I want you to list all the things. We're going to start right here. We're going to put them in a prioritized list. And you know what he said to me? He said, well, I want to save my marriage. And so we wrote that down. He said, I want to influence my kids. We wrote that down. He said, I don't want to lose my influence in the church, my local congregation. We wrote that down. And as we're going down the list, we get down to about number eight. And he said, oh, yeah, I guess I should have thought of this first. He said, I want to have a relationship with God. And so I circled that one and I said, here's the deal. Until you're willing to make number eight, number one, none of the rest of these are going to matter. Until we as men are willing to have a relationship with God, then we're going to struggle with things like pornography. We're going to struggle with things in this world that are going to cause divide in our family and our relationships. I pray for all you single young men out there that perhaps are struggling with the changes in your body and understanding that you're seeking a wife. I'm burdened by this struggle of lust that maybe you are experiencing, but I got to tell you, this burden doesn't get any better throughout your life. You've got to learn to deal with this. I tell young men all the time in their early 20s, Pick a girl. What's wrong with you? Find a woman and and marry her. What's wrong with you? What are you waiting for? I see a lot of this in the church. You know, you have two Christians that are dating each other, and you talk to them, and you find out that they they broke up and called it off, and you say, hey, what happened? And Well, we, we dated for a while, and there were a few things I didn't like, and, you know, it just didn't work out. Young people, listen to me. Here's the deal. There's no such thing as finding true love. Love is something that you build. It's something that you come together and through the Lord and a relationship with Him and understanding the relationship that He had with the church. You build love. You build that relationship. I'd been married for years when I figured out, hey, I, I love my wife. I really do. I, I love her. And it was the action of emptying myself to make that happen. Where are you men when it comes to purity? Well, let me ask you tonight, where are you men when it comes to spiritual growth? I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes here, When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put away 
childish things. Men, let me say this. You can only, you can only be young once in your life, but you can be immature for a lifetime. And that's what I see in our culture a lot of times is men who are just living at a level of immaturity that the Apostle Paul tells us to guard against here. There's a lot of men in our society that have this, this Peter Pan syndrome, and I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but these are young men that, that just drift from job to job. They still live with their parents, or they live with a crew of buddies, and they, they focus their energy on, on playing video games or, 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 or going to football games, and, and on and on and on. And they're never willing to sit down and get serious about life. And I got to tell you, that attitude right there is even more prevalent in men's spiritual lives because they never truly grow up and have a relationship with the Lord. And this is what prompted the Apostle Paul to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. He says, watch, stand fast in the faith and act like men. Have you ever noticed that passage right there? Stand fast in the faith and act like men. There's several things that we can take from that little short passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Several key takeaways. Because when you act like a man, it means that you come to the point when you stop acting like a boy. And we all know how little boys act. We all know how they act. You see, they always have the qualities of what, the way kids are. They constantly have to be told what to do. They're constantly having and picking fights with each other and having disagreements and arguments, and they worry to death what other, uh, other kids are thinking about them. They talk about each other. Paul said, act like men. Be brave. Stand fast in the faith and act like men. Let me tell you something, men. God expects spiritual maturity in your life. He expects you to grow up. And I'll tell you something else he expects. He expects leadership. And so as I stand before you tonight, I ask you this question. Where are you men when it comes to leadership? And I'm talking about in your families, husbands, fathers, you know what your role is. Your role is to lead, not to follow. God said in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, he was going to create a help meet. He looked down and he saw that man needed help. He was going to create a help meet. And I got to tell you this, she is a helper. My wife to me, she's awesome. She is a helper she is a support to me. She is a strength and an encouragement to me. She is a blessing and a treasure to me. Are y'all, y'all do put this on the internet, don't you? <laughs> she is a true helper to me, but I'll tell you what she is not. She is not a leader. She is not a leader at all because God has given that role to me. It's on you, men, in your house to lead. It's on you and not anyone in your house. It's your marriage, your kids, it's your house, it's your spiritual life at stake here. It's on you to lead. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, I've always been fascinated by this passage over in 1 Peter chapter 3, because what I find interesting about that is, is that he uses six verses in this chapter to talk to the women. You ever notice that? There's six verses in 1 Peter chapter 3 where he sits there and he talks to the women and explains things to the men and women. But there's only one verse to the men. It's not because he has more to say to the women. It's just that 
men are built differently. And let me explain what I mean by that. We are designed by God to get things done. And so when you, let me give you an example. When your wife brings you home an Ikea box, and it's about this size right here, but it is a full-size dresser, (laughs) and you take that out of the box, you know that the directions there have no words because we don't like to read. Men don't like to read. We want to look at the picture and we want to assemble. We are built and designed by God to get things done. And so Peter was very brief here in his message to the men, and he was very lengthy to the women. You see, women are relationship-oriented, and men are designed and built to get it done. That's why when my wife comes to me sometimes and she wants to talk to me about a problem going on, she just wants to talk to me about it. And I'm already in fix-it mode. I'm like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's, here, this. She's like, stop, stop, stop. I just want to talk to you about it. And that's the way that God has designed men. And so what Peter says here, and, and I don't need to break this down anymore because God has wired you to get it. And so what he says here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Husbands likewise dwell with them, talking about your wives here, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Guys, I got to tell you this. Never has the word of God been so readily available and yet has made such little difference in men's lives than it does today. We have more resources today. We have scripture that we carry with us in our pocket on Bible apps. We have the word of God everywhere we turn and never in the history of mankind has it made such little difference to men today. You see what is desperately needed in the church and in this town is Christian men who will lead their families. Men, listen to me. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 tells you that you are the leader. You're not the weaker vessel because he wants you to lead. He made you stronger. Let me give you a practical example of what I'm talking about. Let's assume that you and your wife are watching TV and there's something risque comes on the TV. If you're leading your family, you're going to get up and you're going to turn that TV off and you're not going to wait for your wife to punch you or her to say something to you. You're going to get up and you're going to turn the channel because you're the spiritual leader in your family. I got to tell you this, and I'm, I'm very embarrassed to share this with you, but there's been tough times in my life where I have been challenged to my inner core. And I've sat down with my wife, and she has taken my hand, and she said, you know what we need to do? We need to pray about this. And I'll tell you why I'm embarrassed about that. Because I'm the leader. I'm the one that should make that suggestion. I'm the one that should see that in my relationship with my wife. Men, listen to me. You initiate prayer in your family. You get your family to church. You make sure that the money is set aside for the contribution. You make sure that your kids' lessons are prepared. That's your job. Where have all the men gone when it comes to leadership? Well, finally, let me suggest to you this. Where have all the men gone when it comes to teaching and mentoring the younger men in our group. I want to talk to the older men in the audience tonight for just a second because I got to tell you this, the younger men, they need us. You see, older men, by God's design and grace, there are things that 
these younger men can get from us that they can't get from anybody else. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 10 tells us, do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. I try to make an effort to reach out a lot of times to the young men in my congregation. I told someone recently, you know, we, we have 350 in, in our congregation, and there is a lot of young men, and I'm talking about young men who are not married yet in their 20s, even their 30s. And I know some of the challenges that these young men are facing in their life. I know that there are times when Satan's going to tell them, you are not a man, and they need for somebody to step up and help them hold their hands up and say, you are a man, you act like it, you can do this. Satan's going to beat them down time and time again. And, and you know what he needs? They need men behind them in the Lord's church to help hold their hands up and say, you can, you can battle this, you know you can. Many times some of these young men have come to me whenever their hearts have been broken by some young lady and, you know, they've, they've been challenged to whether or not, you know, they have what it takes. And they need us older men to step up and say, you do have what it takes. The psalmist writer said this in Psalm 71 and verse 18. He said, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, Till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts, and all that are to come. What David was saying there is that he wants to be able to encourage this next generation to stand in his shoes, to stand and fight against Satan. Where have all the men gone? I got to ask you this tonight as we close. If God looked down on Somerset, Kentucky tonight, would he be able to stand, say that you are the type of man that can stand in the gap? Or would he look down on Somerset like he did in the days of Ezekiel and said there wasn't anyone to stand in the breach? There was no one to stand in the gap. You've listened so well tonight, I encourage you to take out your songbooks and turn to the song that has been selected. We're going to stand and sing an invitation song in just a moment, and I encourage anyone who has not put on Christ in baptism to think about what he has offered to you tonight, the peace that passeth all understanding. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and the only way that we can do that is through submitting to him in water baptism and being raised to walk that new life. Perhaps you've done that, and especially the men in the audience tonight, perhaps you've, you've, you've listened to the lesson tonight and you realize that you haven't been the leader in your family. You realize that you've been absent. Maybe this is the time that you need to make things right. If it's of a public nature, the church here is willing to pray with you and pray for you. Whatever your need is tonight, make it right with the Lord tonight. While together we stand and while we sing.